Um, we are now um, going to have a discussion uh, chaired by Professor Dimitri van der Ville. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, Professor of Bioengineering from the University of Geneva and the University of Lausanne. And also we are joined again by Professor Gallant. Uh, if we have time, we're going to ask for your questions as well. But uh, let's see where we go. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you both for these amazing presentations, pushing the limits of what is possible with functional neuroimaging. Uh, uh, in two very different ways. Uh, I would like to start with the first question for Jack. Um, how do you reconcile this view now given by the Brain Dictionary with our traditional beliefs of the language regions such as Broca and Wernicke? Is this still compatible or should we revise everything? So uh, one thing to remember is this is a language comprehension experiment. It's not a language production experiment. And uh, when people are listening to these stories, uh, there's a, a lot of associations that occur, right? If you hear a story about a dog, uh, you know how a dog smells, you know how a dog looks, uh, you might have had an experience with a dog biting you when you were a small child, right? And I think what ends up happening when you're listening to these stories or any kind of narrative speech is there's a lot of priming that goes on, and I think that's why these entire networks of meaning that uh, reflect all the different locations where different aspects of information are stored in the brain tend to uh, become active. In a language production experiment, then we would assume that uh, Wernicke's and Broca's would become more important because those are essentially bottlenecks for the output of language information. So did you see lateralization effects? The lateralization is much, much lower than you would see in any kind of production studies. Okay. Uh, but this is more or less view with, uh, uh, more or less consistent with uh, the rather diffuse effects of brain injury you get on, on language comprehension. They're not, you know, language production, you know, if you get Wernicke's or Broca's area damaged, you have very severe and obvious deficits that are very specific. Uh, brain lesions to association areas tend to cause much more diffuse kinds of deficits. And uh, most of the uh, patterns, these rich patterns of brain activity we're seeing are in association areas. You also highlighted the importance of data. Um, we, we also heard this morning about these initiatives uh, that will produce more neural data. If, if you would have to choose, would you like to have more data on few subjects or uh, uh, more subjects with fewer data per subject? Well, I was originally trained as a psychophysicist, and you know, which is the, the oldest area of behavioral psychology. And, and um, that traditional point of view in there is you only need, a, uh, you need an infinite amount of data from a very small number of subjects. And that's also uh, what happens in the neurophysiology world. If you're doing primate neurophysiology, you have relatively few subjects, and you collect a lot of data from each subject. So uh, my personal view is that I would given that choice, I would much rather have a lot of data from a few subjects than a little data from many subjects, because that will allow me to create a very detailed model of those specific subjects. And that actually makes it much easier to optimize an experiment with many subjects uh, to look at the aspects of the data you get with few subjects that are most variable. Okay, th thank you very much. So maybe I'd like to, to go to you, Nick, for uh, first few questions. Um, so you've showing now, you showed now these new possibilities using real-time fMRI, which, which is basically a, a non-invasive soft neuroprosthetic tool. Um, uh, could, you, could you comment how spatially specific we could make this, and maybe also which, uh, which mechanism that you target by, by giving feedback of the bolt signal? which is, as you mentioned, an indirect measure of neural activity. Um, um, yeah, very good question. So I think in terms of um, the spatial resolution we could achieve and, and specificity, um, we, I, I think we are probably mainly limited by uh, the noise level in the signal. So if you think about the neurofeedback, what you really need, you need an accurate, robust, reliable signal. Otherwise, the volunteers cannot learn because they don't have enough information about their local brain activity. And fMRI is a relatively noisy business, unfortunately, as also Jack pointed it out. I mean, but there are, there are really new developments going towards higher fields, for example, uh, modifications of radio frequency coils and, and so on. The acquisition techniques have really improved tremendously. So there's some hope. Um, I, I mean, maybe to give you an example, when you do standard fMRI, what people can already do, they start looking at the layers in the cortex. So structures that are a few hundred micrometer thick with, with functional MRI. And, so I would say I probably my, my optimistic view would be or optimistic 
part in, in me would say, well, perhaps we can do something like that, like columnar-specific feedback at some point. Um, that would be great. Currently, I would say, realistically, we are limited by the signal to noise, which means we are rather looking at modules. So the example I've given about the visual cortex, that we look at, at, at the quadrant represented in the visual cortex, and so we talk about the domain of centimeters, probably, what, what we feedback from at the moment. And does it work with everybody, or do you need motivated PhD students? <laughs> Um, it's always good to have motivated PhD students for several reasons. Um, but um, yeah, uh, so it, it doesn't work with everybody. So um, in, in the visual cortex study, for example, um, five subjects did not learn. Mm -hmm. So despite having the same type of feedback, same type of instructions, they did, did not learn during the, uh, during the training. Um, it's not completely understood why some people learn and why they don't. And, and I think it may also be related, um, again, to how we approach uh, the problem, how, how we train them, what, what kind of instructions we give to them. The, these are important topics in, in the community quite controversially discussed at the moment, in particular in terms of do we provide strategies to them or do we just put them in front of the screen and, and ask them to kind of increase the activity or decrease the activity. And they so need to figure it out themselves. And they themselves. need to figure it out. So in, in, in terms of motivation, what might also help in this context is a lot of people started using explicit reward, like for example, to offer a, a certain reimbursement or money depending on the success, um, which can, can be a boost. You also mentioned the, the, the clinical applications, which could be of course uh, tremendous, but how economically feasible would it be to have a real-time fMRI treatment? And do you think this is really an application or are we more learning about fundamental mechanisms and then uh, we use different devices mm. to train people's brain? Um, I, I think it probably depends on the disorder. If, if, um, and I, I should say that when we talk about clinical applications, I mean, this is really early days mm -hmm. where we are at the moment. The clinical trials really need to be done and, and efficacy has to be shown. But let's assume it's successful, then I, I think it really depends on the disorder. So if you, don't, if you have very few alternatives or none, then it might be quite well economically viable to do mm -hmm. this in the MRI scanner. If, if you are in a situation uh, maybe where it's just a, 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 a good competitor com compared to the other treatment, then maybe what you might want to do is to um, you use it in conjunction with other treatments or maybe use it in conjunction with other neurofeedback devices. So, for example, uh, one, one group in, in the EU project, what they are looking at, they are looking at PTSD at the moment and they are looking at training of the amygdala activity using real-time fMRI neurofeedback, but then they also translate this into an, an EEG um, uh, neurofeedback device. So, so people can be uh, trained with both at the same time or one after the other, so you can maybe make a migration from the expensive tool, the more difficult tool to use uh, the, the fMRI scanner or MRI scanner to your feedback um, with EEG that is more portable and more easily applicable. And maybe use the fMRI for the calibration? For case. example, for the calibration or maybe also to kick off the learning because um, that, that's again not completely understood but it appears at the moment that people learn rather quickly with a, a real uh, with a neurofeedback based on on the bolt signal on the hemodynamic signal and it's not completely clear why why that might be the case maybe, maybe actually the sluggishness of the response might be helpful here yeah. who knows talking about clinical applications jack can you see a potential clinical application of the brain dictionary in some disorders or? I, uh, well, I think there's, I think uh, these very high resolution systematic mapping methods are gonna uh, be increasingly applied to brain disorders, not for therapy, but for just understanding the disorder. So uh, one of my collaborators is starting an autism project. And uh, you can imagine that these kinds of semantic maps that are the uh, sort of uh, the maps of how you interpret the world, right, uh, might be very different in autistics than in, in uh, Neurotypicals. Mm -hmm. um, so there are, are a variety of you know different disorders where functional mapping might be useful. Um, I think one of the complications of all of that, however, is as I mentioned in the talk, uh, these maps are very 
uh, plastic, and they depend on attention, and they depend on the task. Mm -hmm. And so uh, it's, I think it's going to be a challenge uh, if you have a patient population, say with somebody with PTSD or somebody who has autism, to dissociate sort of underlying uh, real changes in the functional neuroanatomy from these sort of, uh, you know, attitudinal, task-related, attentional kinds of, of changes. Now, maybe that is not important, but you're probably going to want to know, you know, what kind of mechanism are you looking at. I, I think it's, it's going to be uh, a challenge. I think a, attention and task is going to be a challenge for all of fMRI, because I think every fMRI experiment we've ever done has had a task-dependent component to it that we usually don't see because we don't, you know, we only manipulate one thing at a time in most experiments. I don't know if we have questions from the audience. There might be. Yes, there's a gentleman here. Um, thank you very much. Should I, I tell you what, I'm going to bring you a microphone. I'm multitasking, putting someone out of a job. I didn't mean to do that. Thank you. Can you remind us who you are, please, before you start? Thank you. Hi, right. Paul Schacher from the Max Planck Institute for Brain Research. So I find the decoding uh, very interesting and inspiring. And you both mentioned the resolution as a bottleneck uh, in the fMRI due to the indirect measurement. So <laughs> theoretically, could we use a high resolution data from vertebrates with transparent brains from, let's say, calcium imaging, for example, taken from zebrafish? Well, nowadays, we can do whole, whole brain imaging in real time showing them, exposing them to visual stimulus. Let's say we take visual stimulus that is relevant for humans due to evolution reasons, simple kind of visual stimulus, and try to put it in order to try to match it with the human brain, like conserved areas, and try to improve the decoding. Oh, I think that's a question for me. Likes to so uh, you, you can certainly use the encoding-decoding model approach to build a neural decoder. In fact, the whole encoding model approach that we use from MRI comes from neurophysiology. The encoding models are the models that are traditionally used in neurophysiology, and the decoder is just a gloss on top of that. And uh, actually, uh, one of my grad students, the same person who published the language work last month, uh, actually was collaborating with uh, Udi Isakov's lab at Berkeley to decode uh, zebrafish brains using calcium imaging. So that paper should hopefully be coming out sometime soon. Uh, how much that's going to tell you about humans? Well, you know, zebrafish and humans are a pretty long way from each other. Uh, <laughs> Not always. Zebrafish have an optic tectum. Humans <laughs> have a visual cortex. There are a lot of differences. Um, I think it would, if you're interested in humans, you know, animal models are fantastic, but if you're interested in humans, I think the best thing you can do is increase the resolution of MRI. And there are, uh, as was mentioned earlier, there are many initiatives going on right now to increase the resolution of MRI. Right now, we're sort of at the hyper column level. Uh, ocular dominance columns are barely accessible, but nothing else, nothing below that level, nothing finer. Uh, but the next generation of MRI might well get down to, say, three to 400 microns in resolution. And if you can do that, then you can actually decode cortical columns. Or uh, you can build encoding models for columns. You can build decoding models for columns. And you'll basically be working at a at the level that's a proxy for a local field potentials. It'll just be blood flow rather than LFP. So I think there will be a, a huge, uh, you know, a, a huge gold rush of new information uh, when that happens. OK, thank you very much. Um, thank you for that question. There's a question in the front row. And then there's one more here. And then I think we probably ought to break for lunch. Thank you. Gold mine. OK, thank you very much for interesting presentations. I have a question to Dr. Gerant. So um, yeah, you have shown that so yeah, narrative semantic atlas or human brain. Okay, so the activity of the so-called broker area was okay low. That is some, somewhat unexpected for me. Uh, could you make comment about that? Uh, as I recall, we do have um, narrative semantic information represented in broker's area, even during comprehension. Uh, I can't offhand remember what. It is, but uh, in, in the maps, Broca's area is clearly, you know, semantically selective for comprehension. Now, whether that's uh, an intrinsic comprehension sort of process that's going on, or whether it has something to do with subvocalization that occurs during comprehension, we don't really have any way to know at this point uh, without doing further experiments. Uh, but the remarkable thing is that, you know, 
we might have expected going into this experiment that we would only see brocas if uh, production and comprehension were symmetric, but clearly they're very, very different things, right? And once you sit down and think about it, it kind of becomes obvious. When you're listening to someone speak, you're trying to understand what they're saying. You don't really care a lot about how they're saying it. But when you're trying to produce speech, uh, the way you say it turns out to be very, very important. So there's actually different kinds of information in language is, is relevant to speaking and listening. Okay, thank you for that question. Uh, it was a gentleman on the third row here. Thank you. Yeah, I have a question to both speakers, and it uh, pertains to the following. I'm wondering, if you have a prior experience to what something that is shown in the film or what is told in the narrative story in the MRI experiments, how does it affect the encoding, um, so basically what you measure, and in the end, and also the decoding? I can imagine that that also then will activate, for instance, memory systems that then also become involved in your association. And in the end, is that some kind of variability you can control for in these studies? Uh, well, when you repeat, I can, I, can, I can tell you, because we do this for our validation data, when you repeat the stimulus, so essentially people are watching reruns, uh, the amount of brain activity goes down pretty quickly because people don't care anymore. They're just not paying attention. Uh, as far as how can we control for the stimulus variables versus associates of the stimulus variables, that's you know, a much more difficult thing to do. And one common criticism uh, we get about this work is that you know, because these complicated narratives have a lot of correlations in them and correlations with your prior experience, you don't really know if the map you're getting is due to correlations or due to a feature in the stimulus. And I agree that's completely true, but you also have the opposite problem, which is if you're trying to understand semantics and you present words one word at a time, now uh, you've got the brain operating in a completely different regime that's, that's you know, probably nonlinearly related to the way it normally processes narrative speech. So you get an answer that's sort of a different kind of answer. And actually, if you build a model in that context, it does a very poor job of generalizing to a natural narrative speech. So it kind of depends on what you want to know. You know do you want to know a lot about a little or a little about a lot? <laughs> OK, thank you. Professor Weiskopf, do you have an answer to that question as well? Um, yes, may maybe just one, one point I'd like to make. In, in terms of uh, c controlling for these effects, what we obviously try to do is um, select the uh, subject groups appropriately and randomize as well as possible so we don't get uh, biases by prior prior experience and for example one aspect might be that they have no or maybe they have experience with new feedback and we, we control for that or or we also for example um, controlled for experience in imagery and abilities of imagery and interestingly they don't seem to have such a big effect um, in, in the end in, in terms of uh, the training success so we were rather surprised by that. Okay, thank you very much indeed for those questions. Um, Professor Dimitri uh, van der Ville, thank you for chairing that discussion. Professor Weiskopf, Professor Gallant, uh, thank you for your contributions. Well, that